thanks everybody for making it here today. And um, I know that uh, doing something the day after karaoke at MCN is um, somewhat dicey sometimes. Um, but thanks for getting here. Um, I'm here, my name is Matthew Israel. I'm the director of the Art Genome Project at Artsy. I'm here to introduce you to our session, which is called How to Discover Art on the Current State, Hardships, and Potential of Art Search. Now, Emily and I uh, propose this panel as a way to bring together traditional and non-traditional art institutions that work on the challenge of art search and all of its uh, variations. Our presentations are going to focus on projects that seek to move beyond traditional um, projects and, and art search terms that are based solely on tombstone data and to look at ways in which we can make art more easily discoverable and accessible. Now, uh, just to give you a basic sense of uh, format, we're all going to be presenting for a little bit over 10 minutes, and then we're going to enter into a discussion period. Great. So, um, let me go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, your slides are good. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, very specific and slightly esoteric topic. We're very happy to have you. Um, so when Matthew and I met at Museums on the Web this spring, we um, were immediately talking about a project that I presented on, which is Art Babble, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but we sort of began to immediately talk about what does it mean to look for art? Um, how do we build these systems? And how are these systems changing? And um, I think that when you think about Web 2.0 and sort of the, the availability of new different ways to search, that art sort of um, is at the leading edge of figuring out new ways to look for information. And I think that as we continue as museums to um, welcome user-created content and um, user-focused type of experiences online, we're going to continue to see the way that we mm, my first slide, there we go. We're gonna to continue to see the way that we access this information online, the way that we store it um, change. And so um, for my part of the um, session, I'd like to talk about uh, related content. And my job really has been focused on um, in, in both at Indianapolis with Art Babel and now at the Getty, is focused on the content around the art. Um, and these gentlemen here are really focused on the art itself. And, they're, and so I wanted to talk about some of this related media and searching for it. And I think that there are a lot of complications. And I don't even really necessarily have any answers. But it's something that I think is uh, we're sort of all in the field determining answers together as we build things like educator subsites and, um, and uh, media sites like Art Babel and things that, things that sort of aggregate this content that sits around artworks. Um, so, uh, I want to talk about uh, the visitor's relationship to art. I think that it's increasingly complex, and I think that the availability of art to a user is changing every day. Um, first of all, they have 24-7 access to information. And as you all know, this is um, dramatically changing the way that we reach people. Um, mobile is, is um, I think, changing the beginning, or in the beginning stages of changing actually how people think about information and therefore changing the way that they're going to be looking for it. Um, it's also the breadth of information that's available. We all struggle with this. How do you offer people what they want when you can literally give them every bit of information that's ever been created? So what are we pulling to the top to give people? Um, and something I've been increasingly thinking about is what does it mean when a website becomes a destination instead of a source of information? Um, so as we begin to look at our website as being a place that people want to be, uh, what does that mean? How are they looking for things differently than simply saying, I'd like to know about the Mona Lisa, da da da, oh, it was painted in, oh, I should have looked up. Should have looked that one up before I referenced it. <laughs> um, how 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 does the fact that they're actually going and and the website itself becomes 
becomes the place where they are change how we're looking for information. So um, I'm trying to be realistic about the future of what people are looking for. It's not an easy answer. It's not a one fix answer. Um, but but what are these, what are normal people or people like teachers, these specific groups, what are they looking for when they begin to um, use the website in some of these different ways? Um, so the first project I'll talk about is Art Babble. Um, I worked at the Indianapolis Museum of Art for five years, and Art Babble was launched the second year I was there. And last fall, um, I was able to lead the website redesign. And one of the major projects that we did on it, is anybody, are people generally familiar with the website? Okay. Um, so basically, one of, the, one of the biggest undertakings is that we actually flipped the navigation of the site to use the taxonomies that we were creating to be the navigation. And this was sort of a vast departure from the way the site was set up before. And um, the way that it started is in the old site, um, it was really just one giant pool that all of our partners tagged into. And then we pulled these sort of selected terms out of that to create this um, sort of structured taxonomy, but really very loose. It was either approved or not approved, and you could search from that whole pool. Um, what we did is that pool of 3,000 terms, myself and my incredibly dedicated intern, um, went through that entire pool and actually created what you see here is um, we created seven sub taxa to create a new taxonomy. And this was really a, um, a labor of love. It was a, it, it was sort of a, a touch and feel sort of situation. So we read through them. We saw what people were tagging. We wanted to give people, uh, to give our partners and also the users tags that made sense with how they were tagging and looking for art. And one thing that's really difficult about Art Babel, as I was talking about in, the, in my intro, is that we both have videos that are of artwork, <coughs> but then we also have things like videos from Art 21 that are, partner, that are um, artists like going out to lunch. Where do you classify that? Where does that fall? It's still about art but it's not really about any artwork. Does it just get tagged with the artist's name? How do we sort of begin to classify all of this? And so one of the most difficult ones, you know, medium, pretty easy to classify, although gets a little difficult when you get into contemporary art. Um, the, the most difficult one was themes. And we thought long and hard about how to begin to classify these things. Um, we ended up with sort of a loose classification based on some terms from the Library of Congress. But again, these were not directly tied. Um, some of the other things that we used are actually from the Getty, which is where I work now, um, which included um, the thesaurus of geographic names and um, the other one that is not on my list. Uh, <coughs> I can't even remember what the other one was. Are you like architecture? architecture? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so basically, we were using these. <laughs> we were using these. Uh, we were using these predetermined lists to begin to tie our search terms to standards, while still allowing them to be able to grow and change with what the site needed. Um, as we as we continued to tag, we sort of hope to be able to let Art Babel grow to incorporate new tags as needed in the future. Um, the other one that uh, I'm now working on is the Getty Education subsite, which is part of the Getty site as a whole. And this problem has been really interesting. The Getty is so large that actually our search doesn't function for the entire site as a whole. And so there's been a, there's a lot of tension in that um, that a lot of people don't know that you can't just search right up here in the search bar for these educational resources. And so how do we get people down into the curricula pages to begin to then um, search for what they're looking for. It also becomes an issue of, um, because the Getty has been creating teacher materials for a long time, we end up with these pages that actually are sort of like secondary artwork pages. We call them things like um, uh, tips and tools for teaching or teaching questions. But if somebody doesn't know what they're looking for, 
they might actually end up on our Van Gogh Iris, the Education Van Gogh Iris's page, instead of the artwork page itself. So how do we begin to uh, make some of these determinations within the site to get people to the information that we need? Um, the Getty Education team will hopefully be launching a new um, curriculum search soon that's, that's greatly updated. And we will be starting off with about four facets. So you'll be able to search within, oh, New events in New York and Los Angeles. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I hope nothing embarrassing comes no, in. I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we'll, you'll be able to search against these facets. We're starting with, um, I think, artwork material grade, which is uh, obviously the most popular one that teachers use. And then um, I think also sort of length of activity, which we've found is something that teachers are really interested in. Um, it has been uh, something where, uh, as I've only been at the Getty for about 10 months, but as I've begun to dive into this, you sort of realize how far reaching this problem is. Um, when you then consider like one step out, you're looking at all of the video that's been created. One step beyond that, you're talking about all of the interactives that are then sort of stored in these pockets of the website. How do we bring all of this together to sort of get your arms around it? And then the other thing is, is once you get um, using, again, using irises as an example, we're not, as we now move in time into the future, um, we're not going to be creating less material. So in five years, when we have, I'm sorry, 50 years, when we have 50 videos on the Getty Iris painting, uh, Van Gogh Iris's painting, how are we going to pull the video that people want to see to the top? How are we going to supply them with the other videos that then are actually, if they're a teacher, what they're looking for, not what the general public is looking for? And these are all questions that I'm sort of trying to tackle from both a web point of view, but also trying to think like a teacher does. We do have a teacher advisory committee, which I'm trying to um, access regularly as we continue to update these things. Um, and uh, one of the big questions right now, this is our page where all of our curricula and guides land. And I am, we're trying to think about how to reframe this right now. Do we do it by theme? Do we make it um, simply a list of everything that we have? Do we have people land on the search page and not actually ever get to this all curricula page? It's really a question of um, sort of continual evolution and discussion with our teachers. And as many of you know, when you straight up ask your user some of these questions, their answer is either I don't know or they don't really know what else to say other than what already exists. So we're trying to think of this in sort of an iterative approach. Um, some things that I'm thinking about while making some of these considerations are some of the new ways to search that have been coming out. And one of the biggest dichotomies that I'm looking at is the question of um, social search as w through Facebook that I've looked at or that I've uh, posted here. And then um, on the, the reverse side of that is sort of the very data-driven Google approach. And looking at those as sort of two, I don't know if they're diametrically opposed, but two sides of the same whole. Um, so if a teacher has other teacher friends, then it might behoove them to be able to search things that their colleagues have looked for. In the same way, I think Google is doing really interesting things like image search and the ways that you can now actually look for an image that looks like one that you already have. So I know I want something, and you get some really funny answers with some of this. You know, you're looking for something with sort of a, like a blue stripe through the middle and then it pulls up something that's completely different. But you begin to see the ways that we can actually access this data and pull it all in to new ways to find what we're looking for. Something that intrigues me about this, as I referenced earlier, is user-created information. Um, and I think that that's going to be an increasingly common problem for institutions. Um, one thing that the Getty has tackled recently, the education department started a Pinterest page. And um, we have things, one of our most popular and, and most, uh, we have the most of them so far on Pinterest is um, user created in the gallery haiku for an exhibition. So do we pull that into the website? How do we index it? How do we um, give it any sort of uh, relation to the person that created it? And do we want to let people find other people's 
uh, sort of user created information. I, I don't think that these answers are easy, but I think that they're really important to begin to consider as we build the frameworks to then tack this information into. Um, so I think, uh, I, as I said, I don't have any answers. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think that it's important for us all to continue to talk about and share this as we build these frameworks to then um, share with each other and talk about uh, problems we're facing, but also solutions that are coming up. I also would love to see people in the museum field continue to look outside the museum field to things like Facebook graph search to um, find new solutions to help people to get to the information that they're looking for and continue to come up with um, creative solutions to some of our information problems. So thank you. I'm Dustin Wieson. I'm the director of metadata at Art Store. Uh, this just gives you the sort of the basic facts, which m many, if not all of you, know pretty pretty much. Uh, the Art Store was founded in uh, in went live in 2004, funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and basically it's it it offers a ever-growing digital library, a library of digital images to, to academic, uh, educational, uh, non-commercial enterprises. Uh, my job has been through, through this for about 10 years now, is to help gather the data that is contributed and fit it into the art store schema. That's basically what the metadata team team does. When we first built the first, I don't know, 300,000 images, something like that, uh, it was from three or four contributors. We launched with each of, this is each is a contributor, or we call it a collection. And we had three, four, five, six, seven, something like that. And for each one, we built a uh, browse structure unique to that collection. So for example, for the Art History Survey collection, which was a, a, a collection that really did cover, obviously, an Art History Survey, we built the browse structure as a kind of like a textbook going from ancient to modern with, with chapters on non-Western subjects. And for the Illustrated Barch, which is a collection of about 55,000 old master prints, we, we built a, a, a browse structure within that collection that was, was very much suited to this being a publication. You could browse by volume or you could browse by nationality and then by century of, of print um, within nationality. We, just, we learned fairly early on that building tailor-made browse structures for each collection was very time consuming and it didn't help browse across collections. Each one had its own little separate thing. So we developed a system of cross-collection browse. Maybe I should describe, I'm boring you with this introductory stuff in order to set the stage for what we might try to do better. Um, so we, we built the, this browse structure that's based upon geography and classification. Geography is basically the nationality of the artist or where the building was built and or where the building was built. Um, classification is that most of them are object, broad object type terms, paintings, sculpture and installation, architecture and city planning. But because Art Store has a lot of stuff that isn't straight art, we also have um, broad classification terms that uh, shade into something almost more like subjects, um, humanities and social sciences. Uh, uh, science, technology, and 
engineering. I've forgotten what that one's called. But so we have these other classifications. And what we did was assign every record in art store, and it meant by going back to the first 350,000, assigning them at least one geography term when we could, at least one classification term, and a numeric earliest and latest date to make uh, that date searching possible. We, we put this both on the, the browse part on the, the, the sort of introductory page, but we also built it into an advanced search where you can select from as many as you want, the geography terms and, and classification terms, as well, and, and earliest and latest dates, but also enter a keyword search term. So you could search for portrait Fran France 17, 50 to 1780, uh, and, and get a, a kind of narrower group. But portrait would, would be here, I, just a, a keyword. And by keyword, that means that word somewhere in the record. We pushed that same, uh, subsequently, we brought those same uh, facets out to, a, to, a, to the results of a search. So when you do a search, you get a page of thumbnails. And on the left, you, you can get these, these ways of filtering based, again, upon uh, classification and geography with a nifty little date slider at the top that allows you to narrow or, or, or widen your, uh, your, criteria, your date criteria. We also um, discovered that we had a lot of information that was, is, is quite like uh, Amazon's people who bought this book also bought these books, these other books, uh, that we call associated images. And we did this by analyzing uh, instructor image groups. In Art Store, instructors build image groups to, that might be key to each class or each, each week's uh, images. Uh, and we, we analyze those to find out what images were related to what images in those image groups, so to speak. Uh, I can give you the actual stats, but it's, it gets kind of complicated. But anyway, it means that this image is associated with some other images in instructor-level image groups. And if we expand that one, we click on the little, little associated images icon, you get a group of images that, are, that are, have been associated with this one. This was a, is a tricky one in front. It, it's one of those things where you think, whoa, our store must be really cool because this is so useful. The, the original search was for Qing Dynasty um, and, 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 a, and another category that I don't want to get into, but that narrowed it down to what we saw on the first page. We open that. This, we start with this one Qing Dynasty robe uh, called a chuba. I don't know how to pronounce it. But it's spelled like chuba. Um, <laughs> and lo and behold, we get this amazing set of images, many of which had nothing to do with the Qing Dynasty whatsoever. And what you discover, I'll just show one of them, um, uh, is this, one of the things you discover when you did a search for Qing Dynasty and then clicked on that, that the tuba, uh, is you can get to a Tiffany vase, just a gorgeous object in my mind. Um, with a peacock pattern, which in fact is the basis for most of the images in this in, in this cluster, they somehow got together because they all had to do with with, with peacocks or peacock feathers. So there, there's this way we've already sort of set up the possibility for discovering stuff in Art Store that isn't just the simple, straightforward uh, keyword word search way. But by and large. 90% or whatever it is of, of our users go straight to this box and enter a term. That, that can be messy. Um, that can be messy. Um, a search for, for impressionism. Maybe I'm supposed to stand here. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a search for impressionism will bring up any record where the word impressionism appear, any record that has that word in it. We have some records 
they're museum records, in fact, where there's lengthy descriptions associated with, with the work of art. And in that description for these works by Francois Millet, it's, it's in a sentence, but it says something about not impressionism. So a search for impressionism brings up these w images of works that are not. <laughs> um, so keyword is, is, as we all know, a, 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 a sort of uh, crude instrument that may or may not uh, give us what we want. Well, several years ago, we did, uh, we did a sort of quick and dirty analysis of, of what we what people were searching on. We were sort of curious, what, what did peop people's searches that where they got zero hits? Uh, that turned out to be not very interesting because the top 1,000 terms were misspellings uh, that we couldn't really help people with. It wasn't like, oh gosh, if we'd added a term that they used, they'd be able to find something. Um, but we did uh, discover, this was several years ago, that the main the, the primary uh, access point was an artist's name. And so several years ago, we started on a project to link our, the creator names in ArtStore to ULAN. And we have a copy of ULAN under the hood, and we match the, our creator name to the ULAN name. We don't change the data we've received. We don't change that name. But by virtue of linking it, we gather, we associate each record with, with the variant names for that creator. And as you know, that, that would make it possible to search for Michelangelo in, in Chinese or Japanese. Now, now that the Getty has done so much uh, to expand the, the, the variant name part, part of Yulan. So that's, that we learned fairly early on and we've been work, we're still doing that, we're still working with that. Um, but recently, I, I decided it was time to do it again. What else could we do? Uh, what kind of, of other search terms might we be able to add? Where should we add them? So, I, so uh, we gathered the, the search terms used in, in about a year. Uh, and uh, given my abilities to analyze big data, uh, we, uh, we, we ended up with five million uh, searches about in a year, and those five million plus searches uh, used about 10,000 terms. Um, I wasn't about to go through all 10,000 to figure out what was going on, so I said, okay, I'll do the top 500 uh, search terms, which accounts for not half, but 40% but about of the of the searches in art store over a year. And just in case you're interested, Monet is the top search. And I think all of the top 10 were artist names. Um, uh, and we get down to Rance Cathedral. It's surprising, how, which was the 500th. Um, my analysis is shaky. I just did it by guessing, oh, this person was searching for something or other based upon this term. But I ran across the word David or David um, and realized that we, I can't always even guess at what, what, the, what did the searcher have in mind. We, we need to solve that. Um, one thing Art Store is talking about doing is you do a search, you get a gazillion Davids, and up pops, do you, do you want the Davids that appear in the creator field? Do you want the Davids that appear in the title field? Do you want the Davids that appear in the subject field? Or, or, or whatever. Uh, oh, this did get messed up. It's interesting. The one thing, we, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, I put these in the order of the, the, the number of terms in that 500. And we see that artist was 284, and the next closest one was subject. And I'm using these buckets, artist, subject, style, period, culture, work type, title, name, and location, region, country, uh, as you can tell, very loosely, just to come up with how many terms in this 500 um, uh, were used. And uh, it, our, one would argue that subject is the second highest, and that's what we should tackle. But as you know, tackling subject is a real pain. Uh, 
uh, it's hard, there is no tidy uh, ULAN or AAT or TGN that, that, that's going to help us exactly. Yes, AAT will, and, and ULAN and TGN can help with certain kinds of subjects, but not for the life of Christ uh, or mythology or whatever. Uh, so, so it's really hard to struggle with, and it's also hard to create any kind of, of hierarchy, any kind of, of uh, taxonomic structure using subjects. Um, with, we, some of you will know about Shared Shelf, which is a, a new product that Art Store is, is working on with a number of uh, of partners and Shared Shelf is a ca basically a cloud-based cataloging asset management tool that that allows uh, an institution to subscribe to Shared Shelf and build their own um, build their own sort of cataloging screen uh, and and catalog in it and publish those images into their hosted collection in Art Store or to other. Um, uh, targets. Th that's an oversimplification. I'm a little embarrassed because Megan Marler, who who manages Shared Shelf, is very close to me here in the front, almost front row, and I'm probably haven't gotten it right. But um, I hope that's close <laughs> enough. Uh, basically, we, we're allowing people to, to to catalog and publish the, their material. One of the real benefits of Shared Shelf is that you can attach to any field you want to when you're setting up your cataloging scheme, your cataloging structure, um, you can attach an, ath an authority to a field. So you can attach ULAN to the creator field and basically enforce good behavior on the part of, of, of your catalogers or your own cataloging. Uh, TGN in the, the location field, AAT in a materials field or a subject field. This in the long run is going to greatly improve the vocabulary control overall of what gets published, at least to in some parts of Art Store and for certain uses. We haven't had a shared shelf. We, Art Store Central, hasn't had a shared shelf, and we've accepted data from everywhere, anybody created any time for any reason, and there's been virtually no control over it at all. So we're faced with 1.6 million records without the benefit of the AAT or TGN, and we're struggling to make you attach ULAN to it. I mean, it's struggling in that it's a big job. So there is this, there is some hope with shared shelf and things like it that we can, we can gradually build up certain fields that have controlled vocabularies, so that in our advanced search, instead of just searching on creator and title is the only two fielded searches we have, um, you'll be able to search on other things because they'll have some kind of useful list of terms to use. But as we, as we think about other tasks, it just seems virtually insurmountable to me, or Mets winning, as hard as the Mets winning the World Series. Um, it's just going to be a real struggle to think through how we can use the analysis of the 500 search terms I did and how we can actually apply that. This is sort of a series of beginning questions of the kinds of things that we're thinking about at Art Store, but we haven't, I was going to say jumped, we haven't taken off to, to actually pursue any of these. We're, uh, just, I'll just close by saying, for Art Store, it's a struggle. It, to do anything is going to be a bunch of man hours, uh, person hours. Um, the metadata team is a relatively small staff. We add between 150 and 200,000 images slash records a year to go back to the 1.6 million and keep up with the, the, the continual annual additions means it's going to be really hard for a, a smallish staff to actually main, main, continue to maintain anything that we have. Just adding the classification and geography uh, is a bit of a struggle, and we hope we can <coughs> encourage more and more contributors to use those terms themselves so we won't have to uh, 
uh, add them before we load them into art store. So it's a big challenge for us, but as the collection grows, we, we know we have to do more to, to make it possible to find what you're looking for in art store. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Adrian from Keep Thinking, um, from London, and uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, two related projects, uh, your paintings and your paintings, Tagger. Um, your paintings, I don't know if any of you are aware of it, this is a big BBC uh, public catalogue found, foundation partnership initiative uh, to catalogue and showcase the entire UK collection of, of uh, oil paintings. And your paintings, Tagger, is a companion project. It's, a, it's a, I think, a fairly groundbreaking crowdsourcing project to actually uh, enhance the data that we got from, from the collections that participated in the project um, to improve the discovery of that uh, amazing collection. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit uh, about your paintings and set the scene for why we wanted to do Tagger, um, and then about how Tagger works and some of the things in, in the directions that we're moving in next, which, which uh, interestingly follow very much on from uh, Dustin's uh, uh, um, um, analysis of some of the issues that, that they'd addressed. Um, so just a little bit about me, uh, for those who don't, have never met me before. So I'm Adrian. I used to be head of IT at the Royal Opera House, the VNA. I was director of, of European Operations for Gallery Systems. And I spent most of the last 10 years as an independent consultant working mostly for museums and cultural organizations uh, and, and uh, recently joined Keep Thinking, who I've been working with on a number of projects um, uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so. Uh, keep thinking, we're a digital design agency, have uh, software uh, uh, um, uh, the development as well, and we also do strategy. Here are some of our clients. Um, okay, so your, your BBC, your paintings, um, what is this? It's a partnership project, as I say, between the BBC, everybody knows the BBC, and the Public Catalogue Foundation. For those who aren't aware, the Public Catalogue Foundation is a UK charity that was set up specifically to do this project. Um, uh, somebody had this great idea, wouldn't it be brilliant to actually catalogue every oil painting in, in public ownership in Britain? Initially, it was to create printed catalogues of, of these works and make them available for sale. Um, over the course of the project, uh, we, we switched uh, direction uh, and, and decided to do this as an online project, approached the BBC, uh, and we're very lucky enough to be commissioned as a, as a partnership pro, uh, project in the <coughs> Knowledge and Learning uh, Division. So um, your paintings went live in 2011, uh, and it includes, the, as I say now, the, the entire collection of, of UK old paintings, um, and that took about 10 years to actually digitize the, the works of art. So overall, there's, there's 212,000 paintings representing 48,833 artists uh, from 2,688 collections. Now, those collections are collections from across uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, and they represent everything from the National Trust, which is the largest collection with something like 13,000 paintings, to very tiny uh, collections with one paintings, and they're hospitals, schools, police stations, civic buildings, uh, where, where these paintings are. So. Uh, an enormous logistical uh, challenge to actually catalogue, digitise uh, two, 212,000 paintings, uh, but we managed to do that uh, and put them together. And, and the website now, since, since going live in, uh, in 2011, has reached 400,000 uni unique visitors uh, per month. And of course, that's partly to do with the reach uh, that the BBC uh, are able to bring to this, but uh, also the, the, the sort of the extraordinary range uh, and visual sort of uh, quality of the material um, that's in there. Um, so, in terms of the in terms of the proposition, it, it's 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 a it's a, a general audience uh, proposition. You know, BBC and uh, you know are clearly focused on on uh, uh, um, education, entertainment for the wider public as part of their their sort of re remit. So, um, but the the the. Uh, what we're trying to do in this project is to balance sort of strong academic uh, principles and underlying s solidity of data with ways in which uh, the discovery of that is interesting and exciting for a whole uh, for a whole range of people. And you can see there you can search through you know different routes through paintings, artists, and but what BBC do within this when they've got the data is to actually create uh, more curated layers on on top of this. And, and uh, there's lots of videos and talks and, and using well-known people to to try to draw that in. But what I'm going to focus today on is the underlying data and, and, the, uh, and, and how that, that was set up and how we're looking to improve um, on that. So 
In, in terms of an a, 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 a index page here, as you can see, you're, you're faced with 212,000 paintings. Now, how do I find those? Uh, so just, just to say that all of the data that was received from the, from the uh, 2,600 collections was the same set of data. We asked them to deliver us the same metadata. We couldn't handle having different, uh, different metadata from each of those organizations and hope to harmonize that within the time scale that we had. So we took an approach that said, let's take an agreed set of data, let's get it into the database, let's put it online, and then we'll look to find ways of enhancing it. So uh, what, we see, uh, what we see here is, is, um, is the, um, instead of the sort of uh, advanced search where you're, you're typing in items and saying and or, we use faceted browsing. So this is a way of presenting all of the content and allowing people to filter for this content uh, using uh, um, the facets from that data that, that we have. And, and we prepared for the next phase of work, which is the enhancement, by thinking about what sort of facets uh, would be, what types of ways in which would, would we, we wanted people to search. And so you see on the, on, over on the far side there, we broke that down into some very simple uh, things, which would be things, people, places, styles, types, events, artists. So very, very straightforward uh, uh, structures. And you see those exposed here on the right-hand side, and, and you, can, you can filter for, for the paintings that you want um, by that. So, of course, one of the challenges in, this, in the first place is, well, where do those things, people, places, events come from? Because in the core data that we received, uh, from, we didn't actually have that data at all. So we had basic tombstone data from the, from the collections, and we then needed to, to, to find that. And that's where your paintings tagger um, comes in, into the picture. It, um, so if we see here now, we do have tags on this painting, and there's quite a few paintings. It's a, it's a you know, a, what, what might seem to be a very uh, straightforward painting in terms of its, uh, uh, its, its subject material and, and what's actually there depicted in that for quite a sparse image. But there's, there's quite a few tags that we have uh, got associated with that. Another picture here of a soldier on horseback, quite a lot of different terms. There's an awful lot of military paintings in, in the 200,000. Um, but here, for example, here's this Lowry painting, which is a very, very dense, very, very nice painting. But uh, if you see here, here are all, the, here are all the, the search terms, the tags that we have related to that, that painting. And there's one that I want to particularly pull out, which is this telegraph pole that appears between there, which you can probably see right at the, right at the back, that, that uh, uh, if we clicked on that, on that, that term, uh, telegraph pole inside your paintings, that will then immediately take you to the 68 other paintings that also have telegraph poles uh, in, in, um, in your paintings. So how do we do that? Uh, and that's what, that's, that is where, where Tagger come, comes in. So, so you see here in the facets, it's, it's finding the, the things there. And the, the facets change so that, that, this is, uh, that the, the artists that we now see are the artists related to those, uh, those 68 paintings. So what is your, painti what is your paintings, Tagger? Your paintings tagger is a crowdsourcing project. This is the this is the home page, um, and uh, tagging is 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 really inviting the public, uh, any anybody who wants to, to actually add what they see in the painting, at, 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 um, and uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a simple flow, and the mecha the mechanism that we you know the only way that we could scale this project and get all of the different uh, uh, type of search terms uh, that that we wanted was to engage the public at large to do this. And, and, and given that we have this site that sits on BBC, hopefully there's a lot of people seeing this and then coming along uh, to, to do that. So very quick facts about your painting. So it's a crowdsourcing. Its purpose is to enhance the collection metadata to facilitate the discovery of, of, of this uh, vast uh, resource. The model is very, is, very, is very simple, but I think it's quite, quite, in, quite innovative. Users are presented with random paintings. They don't get to choose the painting that they tag. Uh, previous uh, other tagging, tagging projects uh, that we're probably all aware about, you choose the painting that you want to tag and then you add your tags to it. That means that some paintings get lots of tags, other paintings don't get any at all. So a way to try to overcome that was to say, well, let's present users at random with a painting and they have to actually tag that painting. We refined that over the, ti over the time that, that we've been working by saying, well, Instead of, instead of getting it from the entire data set, maybe you can choose from a county or indeed a particular collection, and you can edit your profile to say how granular you want it to be. So you could, in fact, tag paintings in your local museum 
if there are any left to tag. Uh, so you could make it uh, uh, that way around. But there was some, there's some beauty about that idea of having you know, a random painting and then having to look at it um, and, and really seeing that painting properly and, and, descri and, des and describing it. Um, you do your workflow, which, we'll talk, which I'll just, just to show you. Uh, your tags are saved. Other people then look at the same painting, and they also put in the tags. Um, and the tags are accumulated for each painting, and they're stored in the database. And we have a, a set of thresholds and results that, that, that determine a result for a painting. So if 10 people look at the painting, and three people say there's a man in that painting, there probably is a man in that painting. But if one person says there's a dog, and only one out of all the people who've seen it, probably there isn't a dog. So we have the notion of accepted tags, where it's clear that there's a result, rejected tags, where it's clear nobody else has done that. And then there's, there's a gray area where, in, in some, some of the workflows, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Is it a portrait or a landscape? You know, it's that, that, that sort of thing. So, and we have a means by which those that are for review go to a supervisory interface, which is a, another a electronic interface that uh, a series of academics uh, that were working on the project will review those and, and push, the, push a conclusion through for those paintings. So the, the paintings, that, the tags that are accepted, are then surfaced through onto, onto your paintings. Um, and, uh, but we save all the tags, and, and having all the tags in the database for each painting uh, is actually uh, uh, itself useful for, for uh, research purposes. So it's launched in 2011. We now have over 10,000 people doing this, and they've created over 3 million tags. And uh, there are some people who really do this, uh, you know, actually more than anything else. And there's, there's a couple of people who, who've got over 33,000 paintings tagged uh, themselves. They, this, this, to them, this is, this is genius, and it is what they want. You know, we have an end uh, in mind, which is actually to, to gather the metadata to improve the searching. But for some people, this is just beautiful. This is what they want to do. They acknowledge they're geeks. We met up with a whole group of them, and they told us why they like doing it. And, and uh, we said, you know, do you want to include a forum where you can discuss things with each other? I said, why would we want to do that? We're just geeks. We just like to do it ourselves. <laughs> you know? um, and we now have over 23,000 paintings that have actually been tagged. Um, uh, so completely, completely finished. Uh, so, but that means in terms of the fact we have 212,000, we've got a long way to go. And this, is, this has been going for two years. So we would say you know, it, is, it is successful, but we need to, to improve it. And just, just very quickly, the, the workflow that we have follows the things, people, places, events, subject types, and styles, which are the facets that we wanted to expose. So what we're inviting uh, in, the, in this flow is for each random painting that you get to, 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 to actually type what are the things, the people, the places, events, etc. And uh, what's, what's interesting here in terms of, of those, those tags, when, when, you type, when you start to type for a thing, um, you get actually a, 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 a list that appears dynamically. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary. So, English Dictionary. so we are making sure that what you type in, if it exists, is actually a real world. And we can associate it with other metadata. So we know you're talking about a chair. We've got a, def we've got a definition there. So, we, so for, for the things workflow, those are stored. You add all the different things in, and you can see it. they're, stored, they're stored on the side. Uh, and, and we're spell checking uh, largely, largely here. But then we have things like people and places. Uh, I'll just show you a place example here. So you type in the place, and it, it's come out, his second item is Bobe Cathedral. That's from Wikipedia, using an, an API to pull in DBpedia. Uh, when, what that means is that when you store that record, OK, it presents itself on the interface as Bobe Cathedral. But behind the scenes, we have the link to the DBpedia record, which means we can associate that painting with the Wikipedia entry for it. And that's about creating sustainable uh, you know, um, open uh, authorities. Um, and we do this sim similarly with, with events. So uh, I think Dustin was talking about, you know, how do you, how do you have an event, you know, like whether, whether it's the crucifixion or well, the Battle of Hastings or whatever it may be, well, we link those to Wikipedia. Um, and, uh, so, and then we move through to subjects. We've got a two-layered subject hierarchy, and we came up with this hierarchy based on quite a lot of user research that the BBC were uh, very... Uh, generously able to, to afford to, to do. We, when we talked to a lot of people and we came up with a view, you know, how, how can we have a world view of this cultural content that allows people to, 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 to search it? Um, and then we have 
you know, types, you know, portrait, landscape, seascape, um, as, as other uh, uh, elements of data and, and styles. But what, we, what we're addressed with now is having, having got over 3 million tags in two years, how can we speed it up? Because we've, got, we've still got 90% of the work to go. So one of the things that we've done, we embarked on a research project with the BBC uh, and, and Oxford, Oxford University, the Visual Geometry Department of, of, uh, of Oxford University. And, and we investigated looking at visual recognition t techniques to automate the generation of tags. And um, essentially what, what we're looking to do is to say, okay, well, here are all the paintings that have got man in, in them. And, and uh, the, the model looks at those paintings and says, what's common about these paintings? We also show it some paintings that say, well, th what doesn't have a man? The model understands then, the object model understands what a man is. And then that's used to, to process through all of the rest of the paintings and then generate results that say, well, these are all the other paintings that I found that have got men in them. So we've had some interesting results. So here's a fairly basic one. You type in ship. And then you find you know, thousands of, of, of records that have ships. And uh, you know, here's one, a more interesting one. It is November, after all. Um, so here, here are all the, all the paintings with, with moustaches in. You know, then you can get you know, really sort of, you know, here are all the handkerchiefs that are, that, that are, that are here. Um, and then you know, in, interesting things like profile, you know, not just sort of standard key, uh, keywords. And then another one, slightly more esoteric, village. Uh, so it's really interesting that, that you can move this from very simple keywords through to more interesting, uh, interesting concepts. And we've taken this a little bit further, and we've also done this with video. So we've, with BBC Video processing thousands of hours of BBC arts programs, we're looking at, at paintings in video frames where those paintings aren't necessarily presented straight on. They might be on the side in a room behind somebody who's talking. And that's been very successful too. So the next stage for us is to incorporate this, this visual recognition automation of tags with the manual tags to improve the speed. And, we'll, and there'll be an, an iteration of Tagger that tries to combine the two. Um, so I think that's me. Done. Thank you. My name is Matthew Israel. I'm the director of the Art Genome Project at Artsy. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the challenges we've faced on the Art Genome Project. But uh, first, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of how Artsy and the Art Genome Project actually relate. So um, just a show of hands of people that have actually visited the Artsy site. OK, so most of you. If you haven't, it's the, the, the address is artsy.net. Um, there's some very friendly guy that's sitting on artsy.com, so we're artsy.net. Um, uh, so if you want to check it out while I'm talking, I will not discourage that. So, um, so Artsy, uh, the Art Genome Project is Artsy's search technology. Uh, Artsy is a platform for discovering, discussing, and collecting art. Um, Artsy's mission is to make the art world accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Currently, we have 80,000 artworks by over 16,000 artists. Uh, on the site, and they come from galleries, museums, private collections, foundations, and artists' estates. Uh, Artsy offers one of the largest collections of contemporary art that's available currently online. And since our launch, which was now a little bit over a year ago in Octo October 2012, we've seen 300 million artwork views and more than 1 million unique visitors from around the world. So the Art Genome Project is the product of an art historical study. It's uh, a team within Artsy. I refer to it as a, I, I never worked on a formal think tank, but I talk about it as a think tank within Artsy of people with art historical backgrounds. I'm myself an art historian. Um, and we aim to uh, define the shared characteristics of art. Um, other ways to talk about it is we, we talk about providing sophisticated and dynamic search categories and explain similarities among art and artists. Uh, we also seek to provide sophisticated, nuanced metadata for art education. So, um, you know, I used to be a, a professor. I'm still, I still teach sometimes, but uh, one thing I'd often do is unpack a phrase. So I'm going to unpack that for you. What is sophisticated, nuanced metadata for art education? So. What does that mean? So on one side, you have historical categories for art search. And by historical, I mean just the way that you might search for art uh, you know, in a museum or, or um, you know, currently in various different places on the web. And you get certain categories. You can search for an artist's name. You search for a title. 
you know, medium. Sometimes you get the technique, you get the date, obviously. Uh, you get subject matter coming to you from places like the art and architecture thesaurus. Uh, you also get tags. Um, you know, more and more places are doing tags. I think the thing that the project that I became first aware of was the Brooklyn Museum uh, tagging project. But obviously, there's uh, amazing projects like um, Adrian was just talking about. So, uh, the Art Genome Project has taken a little bit of a different uh, tack. So. We, we've created 20 different categories, so we've really broadened out the possible categories of metadata that you can apply to art and artists. So we have categories for medium. We also have categories for style and movement, so whether something's pop art, abstract expressionism, cubism, impressionism, uh, uh, romanticism. Uh, we have categories for contemporary tendencies, and that's a new one, um, but I think that there's a huge demand for people to learn about contemporary art online, and how do you do that? How do you group together things? And I think that there's a real, we decided that we wanted to actually do some kind of soft categories, and, and initially we had all of these in quotation marks because we were all freaked out by actually making a, a, a real sort of naming things on the web that were actually... Um, you know, contemporary art movements, but so we call them tendencies. So it feels very soft, but, but these are things that are really in the, the discourse right now, sort of contemporary Gothic. A lot of people talk about the uh, Gothic, contemporary surrealism, uh, you know, contemporary um, photographic portraiture. These are things that can, can be quite um, soft uh, in terms of groupings, but they're a great way to sort of lead people to different pl uh, areas to learn about contemporary art. We also have a category for content, uh, iconography that you can find in a painting, um, such as Americana, uh, city life. We have concepts, like associated ideas, which all of you, I'm sure, know is very important for contemporary art, uh, like nostalgia, uh, race. Uh, we have techniques. We have different categories for each uh, medium technique. So we have specific techniques for painting, specific techniques for photography, specific techniques for performance. Um, we have functional object genes. We, for, when we started out, we didn't have design in the art genome, and we actually realized, OK, well, what's a big way to differentiate design and art? Well, the fact that art uh, design is functional. So we created uh, you know, functional objects. So these are things like you know, tables and chairs, uh, lighting. Uh, we have geography genes for where an artist has lived or worked. Uh, composition, look, shape, and line, surface, these are all appearance genes. I think one thing that we realized in, in creating a lot of these uh, terms was that uh, a, a lot of the ways that we talk about art, uh, we forget to actually talk about how something looks. Um, you know, we talk about uh, Saul LeWitt and Donald Judd being associated because they're both minimalists. Um, but we forget to say the fact that they both create things that have cubes in them, you know, basic things that we forget. So a lot of it was actually coming back to basics and close looking, which is, you know, what we're all supposed to be doing. Um, uh, and, and we have genes for color. So a lot of our color genes or our color data is automated, but we actually have uh, uh, things that can't be automated, such as like high contrast uh, monochromatic. So, uh, those are the categories. We have over 900 genes that have resulted uh, from this, and this is a controlled vocabulary. Um, where do these genes come from? You know, hundreds of years of art historical research, obviously, the discussion around contemporary art that's in literature but also online, uh, our debates. We have fierce debates about this terminology in-house, but I think just as important as all of this is um, you know, our constant communication and feedback from the people that we work with, the institutions, the galleries, because I think that by no means are we just inventing some vocabulary and decreeing it uh, for the world, but um, we're really trying to just reflect um, all the work that museums and galleries have already done in creating you know, incredible metadata for art. Um, a few other clarifications about the Art Genome Project is uh, genes are not tags. Uh, tags are binary. It's either on or off. Um, uh, genes actually have values from 0 to 100, so we actually one basic way in which you can think about this is if you're looking at a landscape and there's a truck in the background, you actually look at the landscape and you give it a higher value for landscape and a very low value for, we have a gene for modes of transportation. You know, nuance is very big for art understanding and so you can very much uh, establish the difference between, you know, uh, different terms and how you talk about them when you're talking about art. Uh, and then, you know, I've talked about a list of terms, but a lot of this is actually just a lot of labor by, by a team of people. So people actually going through every single artist and every single artwork that we have on the site and giving them the metadata. So every artist, every artwork has an average of about 20 to 30 genes. 
and um, and uh, we have we've now genomed about uh, 60,000 works uh, in the last uh, I think it's now two two and a half years we've really been uh, moving forward on this and. There's a difference between an artist and artwork genome, so that when you search for uh, Picasso, you get a very different set of uh, uh, data that's um, than if you would search for an individual artwork by Picasso. And I think that that's really important for the way that we create metadata because, um, you know, Picasso is a great example because his work from 1912 is very different from his work from 1930, and you want to be able to have different metadata for those two things and also from a kind of grander statement of who Picasso is of someone searching for him. Um, so one basic way on the site is, is how this results is related art search. So, you know, you search for, the way I talk about it is you search for an artist like um, that you, you, maybe the only artist you know is Andy Warhol and you search on the site in our search bar um, and you get a result for Andy Warhol. You get uh, works that are available and also works from museums and other collections and you scroll down and you can see related artists. So these are artists, you know, that are related looking at the diff, uh, comparison between Warhol's genome and then all these other artists that are coming up, how do they actually, um, uh, or how do they actually align um, in a similar way? So you, you're getting, you know, results. These are, the top results are po other pop artists like James Rosenquist, Tom Wesselman, and Roy Lichtenstein. And then, um, you know, if you, uh, if you search for Mona Lisa, um, you're actually getting uh, uh, artwork results. So these are actually now related artworks that are about having a search for an artwork rather than an artist, and you're getting related artworks. And those terms on top, I know it's a little fuzzy, but that's actually a, um, a kind of faceted search. So you can see all these different ways in which the Mona Lisa can relate to other artworks. So you actually go from a kind of, you can have a formal similarity, and you can also have conceptual similarity. And I think that was something that was really important to talk about. Uh, in terms of how similarity works, that it's not just one type of similarity for art, but it's actually lots of different ways in which things can relate. And these terms actually function like tabs on a folder, so you can click in and you get a whole other set of, of results, sort of like a, a tree would function with a root system. Uh, when you search on our artsy, you can also search for individual genes. Uh, you know, here's a result for minimalism. You can also search for, so any of the 900 genes you can search for independently. And if you're wondering where to find these, we have a browse uh, section where you can see featured genes. Um, and this is a, you know, a prioritized set of genes, but if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you can see um, a whole list of, of all the genes that we have on Artsy. Uh, final point about the Art Genome Project is the value of engineers and designers. And I know I'm at a technical conference, and, uh, but I think, we, I think I really want to stress this, is that we would be nowhere without them. Um, which is all to say that uh, the art genome combines this highly structured metadata, but also with search and similarity results. These are based on uh, principles of information retrieval, and it's all presented in this really kind of uh, uh, reduced package of a, a UX-driven search product. And uh, to say the least, that's very much beyond the skill set of traditional art history. And I put a smiley face to, uh, <laughs> to uh, accentuate that point. Um, so, the, the focus of this, the, this panel is about challenges. Now I'm going to talk about the challenges of the Art Genome Project. Uh, this is to talk about what's currently on our minds, uh, but I also think that these are issues that are common for everybody that's dealing with the issue of art search. And the solutions that I propose, I hope that, I hope this will inform your work. And yes, we're a, um, we're a, an art uh, platform. We're not a museum, but hopefully that uh, people from museums can actually find something that's really helpful for uh, improving or, or sort of a different way of thinking about how they uh, create search on their own sites. So uh, the first problem I want to talk about is the issue of scale. Um, I think we've all kind of touched on this point. Um, and this is the most common question we get regarding our future. Uh, specifically, how do we maintain really high quality metadata if there's a dramatic increase in the number of the artworks that we get? And I think, you know, Art Store is a, uh, you know, we aspire to have the collection that Art Store has, and I think it's a, you know, a, a similar type issue. So, what we've done uh, to kind of deal with this issue, we've increased the size of the team. Dustin was uh, talking about that. Um, we've streamlined our training, our standards, and workflow, kind of how quickly we can bring on people to, um, to learn how to, we talk about it as genoming. Um, we've put into effect gene automation, so Adrian was talking about this, but um, these are for things like 
that don't really require art historical knowledge, sort of mapping data that we're getting from museums and galleries straight into genes. And these are things like medium, uh, date, uh, you know, possibly style and movement if we can get that out of it. Um, we also do automations for a lot of the temporary things that we put up on the site, uh, like art fairs. You know, we get an influx of thousands of works that are just there for <coughs> three or four days to put that labor into to genoming uh, as we do it kind of like more traditionally. It doesn't really make sense. Um, but all this is to say we're still kind of really reliant on specialists uh, and uh, you know ideally we'd have a larger team but we are a startup and finances are definitely a concern as we you know hopefully grow into a, a sustainable business and we've talked a lot about crowdsourcing um, and I, we haven't I mean uh, obviously the tagger system is a is you know a great solution uh, but you know I think everybody is really concerned about information quality and uh, and also this issue of compensation I think that's a big thing that comes up when you know when I talk to other art historians about you know contributing to anything on the web. I think the there was a, um, an editorial in the New York Times recently calling uh, for slaves of the internet to unite. I don't know if anyone saw that, but it was you know kind of great just commenting on this sort of free, freely contributed information. And I think that um, you know I think versus the the discipline of uh, um, I mean the the field of uh, software engineering where a lot of things are open source, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of jobs out there, to be honest. Um, for art history and for curating, it's not, you know, it's not lucrative enough to, to really encourage people to make free contributions. So that's definitely some issue we, we feel, that like, you know, people are spending their time on this, and it's not something that can go into the normal, traditional tenure um, uh, calculations. You know, blogging is not something that uh, really stands next to a contribution to Art Bulletin. Uh, second point I want to talk about is the managing specificity of terminology, and, and for us it's a specificity of genes. Now again, we have 900 genes for art, architecture, and design, and um, on one hand, a specificity of vocabulary, I think for any museum site and for any searchable site, it, 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 it helps people focus search, it helps people find what they're looking for, uh, it helps people get more specific recommendations. Uh, but how scalable is such specificity when you have a group of specialists that's actually inputting this information? Um, because more genes actually lead to potential inconsistencies. If someone's going to, you know, we have a genoming panel, which is like a screen where you actually have to enter in all of these terms. If you have to remember all of these things, you have to have too many terms to actually uh, input, it's very hard to keep consistency. And as everybody knows, if you're trying to create a controlled vocabulary, consistency is extremely important. It probably is the most important thing. Um, another thing that comes up is how accessible is specificity. I think that this is something I've heard uh, during, during this, the last few days. We're talking about how museums introduce uh, ideas and that I think that uh, you know, specificity is great for a scholarly crowd, but when you're talking about specific language, sometimes it can get very granular, very kind of arcane and, and, and um, unapproachable for, for a typical, you know, uh, most of the museum audience. Uh, this is a topic that came up um, recently for us. We did a recent partnership with the New York City Department of Education. We, um, we partnered for them, with them on this uh, project called Digital Ready, which is helping uh, high school students um, gain skills in, in uh, um, you know, digital technology in the classroom. And I think a lot of teachers raise this point about uh, vocabulary, you know, because uh, it's great to have granular information, but at a certain point, you need to have an approachable level of, of vocabulary. Um, finally, there's the issue of mobile, I think, for, for us that we've come across. Now, um, uh, we, we launched a, an app. Uh, hopefully, all of you will try it uh, in addition to the site. It's uh, free. We advertise it as the art world in your pocket. Um, and it was very successful. We were featured in the uh, App Store we, as a best new app. Um, it substantially increased our user base by a fifth and, uh, and uh, our traffic to our website. So it was a real kind of, uh, uh, I didn't really expect it to have such an effect, and I was really um, you know, surprised and, and excited by this. But I think it brings really new challenges to the role of education for the Art Genome Project and, and for Artsy as a whole. Um, and that's something we've been, oh, you know, from the beginning, spending a lot of time on. But as we've increased the features on the site, you know, we've, we've just recently introduced this um, artsy education landing page where you can see a very kind of uh, um, concise overview of our educational content and features, and then specific ways in which you can use artsy in the classroom. 
And so uh, just to talk in one basic way about how mobile changes your experience is that you're moving now from a related artwork screen where you're getting a, um, a display of terminology to explain why you're getting results. You know, and as an art historian, you know, I believe that context is really key. When now on the app, there's really not enough room to do that. So you get suggested artworks, and it really takes away some of the context. And we're now thinking about, well, you know, mobile is such a visual thing, and you have to be really, really um, rigorous about how much, how many features you put into it. Um, but it does change the way that you think about um, uh, you know, education because uh, you have to differently script your information. So you know, in this way, apps have to be more direct. But I think that um, uh, you know, I, I went to the great panel uh, yesterday, was it yesterday or maybe two days ago about um, you know, the, the Guggenheim app and, and the MoMA app and the Met app. And I think those are amazing. And I think that, um, but what, it, what a lot of this brings up is kind of uh, how do we adapt, you know, how do we adapt a website and then kind of art history in general that we're obviously not born mobile? How does, how does an educational experience go into your phone? And uh, will these things ever do art and art history real justice? Or are they kind of all together really different experiences? And should we have different learning objectives for a, a website versus the mobile experience?